All right, 1015, are you ready? Yeah. Oh, you have to do better than that. Diana was already here. I told the 9 o'clock that I preach faster and better when you respond. So if you want to get home, I'm just joking, but we're going to have some fun together, and I'm grateful that you're here. And, and again, if we haven't met before, my name is Keith, and my wife Amy, we had the privilege to serve as the lead pastors here at Blaze Church. And I can't believe we're in November, man. We started, I, you know what I did? I'm going to adjust this a little bit because I put my mask on after the service with the mics. It was just like this, and I just got you guys don't care, but I do. All right, it feels better now. And so I'm excited that we're here and we're jumping into November together. And, and really, I just want to get right into this passage of Scripture because there's a whole bunch that I want to share with you in really a short amount of time. And if you're, if you're a note taker, there's going to be five principles that we're going to discover today. And I'd love for you to write them down. And if you don't want to write them, maybe you can just take some pictures of them. Um, but I really think these are going to help our, our lives as we navigate this week, but as we navigate our lives going forward. So the title of my message is actually Problem Solving with Dave. And so if your name's Dave, we're not talking about you, although we do have a Dave here, and he could solve a lot of our problems. Um, but we're, we're, we're going to talk about a man named David from Scripture, um, and we'll get into his life in just a little bit. But I, I looked up on, on Google, you know, what are some ways that we solve problems? And in fact, just not even knowing you personally, maybe, I would believe that every single one of us, we have a problem-solving strategy. Anybody here, you have, right, you, you have a problem-solving strategy. Mine involves what's in the freezer, somebody. Come on, some ice cream. It's just any, any problem can be solved with a good carton of ice cream. But all of us, we have these ways that we navigate problems in our lives. And I Googled, you know, how do you solve a problem? And there was some good things that were written down, you know, talking about sleeping on it, not really responding in the moment, which I think is great. You know, don't go off of your emotions to solve a problem that you're faced with. Break the problem down. So if the problem is this big, well, let's try to break it down. What things can I control? What things can I address now? What things I have to wait on? Um, there was one that I really think is important. Don't compare yourself to others when you have a problem, right? Because then you get on fake gram, Instagram, and you just, man, their kids, they pose so good in their Halloween costumes. We couldn't get our kids to stay still. And, and you just kind of start scrolling, and you see everyone else, they don't have problems like I do. So we don't compare ourselves. There was one that talked about, you know, learn from your mistakes, celebrate your wins. Really some great stuff. But what I want to talk about today is, is this fact. I believe it's a fact. I guess I should call it opinion. I really do think that a lot of people are putting their hope and the solution to a problem in this Tuesday. Right? Just kind of looking to, well, who's going to be elected and, and, and who's going to be in office and what party is going to determine the next few years of, state and, and our nation and, and all of this. And there are so many that are looking to find hope to a, to a problem and a solution in an elected official. And I want you to know that today, it's not about me telling you to vote or not to vote or who to vote for or any of that. If you were here last week, Pastor Brian McMillan, who did a phenomenal job, one of the things that I really was really challenged by was that a pastor's responsibility is to preach scripture, not to preach opinion. You could amen there if you want me to. If you don't, I'll preach opinion for the next 25 minutes. I got a lot of them. But really, it's, it's really just about preaching Scripture. And, and I'm not going to try to use Scripture either and manipulate it to tell you who to vote for or to vote or any of that. But really what I want to do is I want to stir your heart, especially if you're a child of God, if you follow Jesus, for you to know this truth, that your hope is not found in an elected official. It's found in an ever-reigning king, and his name is Jesus. Come on, give, give a good amen there. It's found in him. It, he really is. In fact, there's this, this old hymn that we, we used to sing like I'm old. I, they say, I say that because I used to sing this when I was a kid, but it was Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. And I, and I really do believe that that's true, that he is the answer. And we're going to see that. But I want to talk about our problems today. And maybe for you, it's not even connected to this Tuesday. Like, you, you're navigating your own, your own problems, but I think this is going to apply to all of us. So we're going to look at King David's life. And maybe you know David from his, like, one of his most famous stories, even if you're not a, a churchgoer or a Christian, David N. Goliath, right? We, we kind of know that story, or you know that term, that this shepherd boy steps out and takes down this giant well, David had a lot of other things happen in his life, and they weren't all giant slaying victories. He had a lot of lows in his life. In fact, I want to show you a picture from my study Bible. I took a picture of it, so it's not the best quality, but look at this. I love the way that it charts the life of David here, and it's called David's life as highs and lows. And so I just, I just like this, and this really just shows you King David and everything he's gone through. And so starting with him anointed as king and killing Goliath, and then he has to run for his life from Saul, then his his city is destroyed. He's king of Judah. He's king of Israel. He makes a covenant with God. And then he's got this on his resume. 
commits adultery and murder, right? That's, that's King David, a man after God's own heart. And then Solomon is born, and then Absalom, his other son, rebels, and then David's king, and then David sins, and then David builds. Anybody want to be honest and say your life looks a little bit like this chart? Come on, wave some hands at me. How about this? Anyone your week looked like this chart? Mine did, and I'm going to talk to you about it at the end of the message. But man, if I were to chart it, it was, praise you, Jesus. Where are you, God? I'm living on the mountain, and I am saying things I shouldn't say and think in my own heart. And it's just kind of going through that. But this, I want to show you because coming to church is not about having it all together. It's not about being perfect. In fact, if Blaze Church ever leans in that direction, I'll tell you, I'm out of here. <laughs> I, I want the culture of our church to be that we're, I, I love what Joe shared a couple weeks ago. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. That really it's about the Holy Spirit moving us from glory to glory. And so you just get a picture of this. And what we're going to talk about today is really found right here when Absalom rebels. And so let me give you a little bit, of, a little bit of the history, and then we're going to get into Psalms chapter 62. But here it is that Absalom was one of David's sons, and really he was actually, his name was Father of Peace. That's what Absalom meant in, in Hebrew. And he was one of the sons that David loved the most. And we're not supposed to have favorites, but I tell Cece all the time, she's my favorite daughter. That's what I say. You're, you're my favorite daughter. But, but here it is that David, he has, he has this son. Now, follow me on this. There's going to be some names you might not understand, but just look at the family drama. His son Absalom has his half-brother, Amnon, assassinated because Amnon raped Tamar, who is Absalom's sister. And you thought your family was messed up. It, this is King David, his children just, just going crazy, murder and, and rape and all of this. And so Absalom then has to flee Jerusalem for three years. And when he returns to Jerusalem, he starts campaigning against his dad, King David. He returns to Jerusalem and starts kind of stirring up this plot to overthrow the king who is his father. He's like, I would be a much better king than him. This is what I would do. This is how I would do foreign policy. This is how I would treat people. I mean, it's all in there in Scripture. He's campaigning to the point where he then has a coup to overthrow his father and have him assassinated. So David has to flee for his life. So we're going to call that today a problem. As we're talking about problems in our lives, we're going to talk about David's problem. And here it is. Now David is on the run. And on the run, he has to write Psalm 62. He cries out to God. This is the question I want you to think about today. What problems need solving in your life? Come on, just let these words just kind of be before you for just a moment. Think, think what are the problems that you, we came in here with? We, we all did. I, I came in with problems. I'm glad that no one amen there, especially my wife. Right? I came in with problems. You came in with problems. There are things that are on your mind right now. There are things that might be relational. Maybe even for you today, maybe you're in church and you're wondering, is my marriage going to survive? And you're doing your best to convince your spouse to, to get connected with others or to, to seek God. And you're just, you're just wondering. Maybe the problem is an addiction that you've tried so many times to beat and to overcome and it seems like it just keeps coming up. Maybe the problem is in your body. Even just to get here today, it just took so much because of the physical pain you're in. Maybe it's a spiritual problem that you just feel like there's this wall, there's this coldness, there's this disconnect between you and God. See, I believe that, that every single one of us, we, we have problems. In fact, Jay-Z, he had 99. Thank you, Adam. I have one laugh in the first service, too. I hope I get another one. Right? I don't know how many problems you have, but here's what I do know. No problem is too big for our God. And that's both in quantity or quality of the problem. And, and I, mean, I mean that. And I'm not going to take the rest of our time to just throw the bumper sticker answer at you and just say, well, Jesus is bigger. I want to show you these five principles that David shows us when he has a very big problem. And I want us to understand these and apply these in our lives. Because following Jesus is not a problem-free life in any way. If someone sold you that, they sold you on a lie. We don't come to Jesus and all of our problems just disappear. Jesus himself said you will have troubles. James says count it all joy when you have trials and tribulations. And so following Christ is not problem free. And yet there are things that we inherit and understand as God's adopted children that when we have a problem, we navigate it differently than if we do not have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I'm thankful for that. And so now with all of that, I want to jump in to Psalm chapter 62. Verse 1 says this, Truly... My soul finds, just say this word with me, rest. That's a good word. David, remember, he's on the run right now from his son. 
after his other son's been assassinated and his daughter has been raped. And he says, my soul finds rest. Where does it find rest, David? In God. My salvation comes from him. He says, truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Now remember, this is a song, and I, I really, I've grown to love Psalm 62, so much so that I believe Blaze Worship can write a song to Psalm 62. How many of you guys want to see that happen? All right, so Joe, you have, a, you have one week, bro, one week. Get it done. Right, okay. But it's just this beautiful song that David's writing. And look, at, he starts off, and he just says, like, my rest is in God. I'm not going to be shaken. See, what David is showing us here is the first principle we need to understand when we have a problem is perspective. We, we need to have a proper perspective. And I got five principles, and they all start with the letter P. So if you're from a Baptist background, welcome home. That joke didn't go over good in the 9 o'clock either, but I'm going to try it in the 1130. So we just got these five things here. So the first one is our perspective. What does David say? David says, my rest is in God. He's got a perspective there. He understands that my rest is not going to be found in the results of humanity. I'm not going to look around me horizontally for what only God can provide vertically. He, he's, he starts off by saying, where's my rock? Well, it's not found in my job. Where's my fortress? It's not found in my relationships. Where's my security? It's not found in my children. It's not found in my kingdom. It's not found in any of that. No, my perspective is telling me that my God is my fortress. And what I love about Scripture is that it's real and it's authentic because notice he does not say he doesn't have a problem. He just doesn't start with the problem. He starts with his God. And he ends that and he says, I will not be shaken. And just by him saying that, he's recognizing there is a problem, but the problem will not shake me. See, following Jesus is not this inauthentic Christianity that says, I don't have problems and nothing's a big deal and I'm never worried and I never... No, it's none of that. It's that with the truth that says, but I won't be shaken. This problem does not have the authority in my life to change my identity. See, our problems don't get that authority once we have been identified by Jesus. Your true identity is that you are an adopted child of God. Your salvation was purchased through the work of Jesus and made real through the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is no problem that gets the authority to remove that from you. There's nothing that says, no, 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 no understand you, you still got this you still that no no you are who god has said that you are when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that god raised jesus from the dead you are saved and so david has a perspective that says god is my rock god is my fortress i will not be shaken now along with perspective which is how we see david gives us this next principle that has to do with seeing as well he says in verse three how long will you assault me some of you have said that to your coworker. How, how, how long would, you, would all of you throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. Don't miss this part. He says, with their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. See, if perspective is how you see something, this next principle is perception. And that's actually the ability to see. Like, to perceive what is going on. To perceive in the middle of a problem, hold on, I want to understand what's happening here. Because Scripture tells us that we don't actually fight against flesh and blood. Our fight is spiritual. That it's not just what you see on the surface that's coming after you, but there is an enemy of your soul who is doing his best to entice and to tempt and to pull you down. He's got three objectives. Steal, kill, destroy. And we need to be able to perceive that in the midst of a problem. Any of you ever interacted with a really good salesman before? Right? And if you're a salesman, I am not hating on you right now. In fact, you do your job so well that I don't want to get close to you because I'm going to always buy what you're selling. It's just, oh, it's just always, you just get me. And, and, and I think the best ones at it are at the mall kiosks. In fact, I have a strategy that I will offer to you that is deceptions and lies. And so you should not do it. And I should probably repent over it. But a lot of times when I found myself walking in the mall and I knew there was something that I was going to be tempted to buy, I, I get a fake phone call. I just take out my phone. I'm on the phone. Sorry. It's completely wrong, people. I should not do it. But I just know I've had, it, I've had a scenario a few years ago where a mall kiosk, man, they got me. They hooked me in. I purchased the product. It didn't work anywhere the way it did at the mall. For some reason, when I got at home, it worked differently. And and I just, I couldn't perceive in that moment. And, and a lot of times when there's problems in our lives, come on, isn't this true? Our perception is off. We get so blinded by the problem 
that we're not able to actually see God in the midst of it. We get so hung up about the solution that's needed that we miss, hold on, God is trying to do something here. God's trying to speak to me here. God has a plan for this. He, he wasn't surprised by this problem, and God's perception is always 2020. He always sees exactly what's going on. And so when we're faced with a problem, I really believe God has given the church, that's you if you are in Christ, two immense gifts for when we are in a problem. And the first is himself through the Holy Spirit. That God has actually given us the Holy Spirit. See, we read in Scripture that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives inside of us, and the Holy Spirit produces these gifts, gifts of discernment. Well, that means to know what's going on. Gifts of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, right? That's the Holy Spirit producing these things. And in the middle of a problem, there's always opportunity to live spirit-surrendered and allow the Spirit to show you what's happening or to live self-focused and process things through our own lens. Now, the second gift that God gives the church is actually the church itself. And what I mean by that is you and I, we need some people in our lives who can look at the problems we're facing and can speak life into us. Man, I needed that more this week than I ever realized. That I need some people that I could share the problems that I'm carrying and facing with that could look at me with love and say, well, here's what I see. Here's how I see. That's why every single week we make it a point to say you've got to be plugged into a Blaze small group. We mean it. Right now, one-third of our church is plugged into a, a small group. And I'll be honest with you as your pastor, you know, I want to see three-thirds of our church plugged into a small group. I do. Not so that we can say numerically this is happening, but because we truly believe that you cannot go through life on your own, that you need a group of people who will connect with you, protect you, and grow in Christ with you so that when you show up to small group with your problem, someone there is able to say, man, I would love to pray with you through that. I'd love to listen a little bit more about what you're sharing. Hey, can we turn to God's word and see what he has to say? It's really about getting perception. Is this making sense to anybody? You're staying with me? Good, let's keep going in here. Verse 5, yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Remember, this is a song, so David's just kind of writing the chorus. He's just going back to that, that one part. He says, my salvation and my honor, they depend on God. He is my mighty rock and my refuge. Trust in him. At all times, you people. Read this next part with me, because I think it's just so beautiful. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Man, that's, that's a verse that I think should make it to the, the fridge or the steering wheel on an index card in our pocket. Because I know that for many, this week is all about who's going to be in office so that there will be, here's our third word, a shift in power. That that too often we look at our problems and we say the solution to my problem is I just need a little bit more power. Is that I've just got to figure this thing out. It's just I've got to work through this. It's just that I, I've got to figure out how best that I can make this work in my life. I need my power. And what does David do here? He says, no, God is my fortress. God is my rock. God is my security. I will not be shaken because God is in charge. Do you understand that the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives inside of us? That, that same power. I love what Paul writes. He's a New Testament author. He's a church planter, someone who hated the church, who then went to building churches and encouraging people. And he says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why not, Paul? Because it is the, what's the word there? Power. It's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And then just to show the inclusion, he says first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Really just saying what started with Abraham is now available for everybody. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good word that's here. That what Paul is saying is the power that we need is actually found in God alone. That you and I do not need to look outside or horizontally for power to our problems before we look up to God he is the source of our power. I hope this is bringing you some freedom this morning. That you're realizing that, yes, whatever Tuesday looks like for you, vote, don't vote, choose, don't, whatever it might be, but I want you to realize that the power that you and I most need is already found in King Jesus. Look at what he goes on to say here. 
Verse 9, surely the lowborn are but a breath and the highborn are but a lie. I'm going to explain that in a minute because I don't know the last time you call someone a lowborn was. Hopefully never. <laughs> you lowborn mouth breather. No, it's, I feel like it flows right there. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Really what David is doing here is he's recognizing while the world would tell us that the solution to our problem might come through a status change or through a financial change, it's really not so much about position, our fourth principle. Recognizing our position in life. Now we're big Disney fans in our house, six-year-old and the four-year-old, and we enjoy the movies and all of that. And one of our family favorites is Aladdin. I, I love Aladdin, and I love the live-action one, and so I'm sorry if that offends you, but Will Smith did his thing. I just, I, I love that movie. But what's the story of Aladdin here? You have one who is lowborn, meaning Aladdin's status and class is a street rat, and you've got one who's highborn, Princess Jasmine in the palace. But they both believe that the solution to their problem is to change their position. That if she could get out of the palace, things would get better. If he could get into the palace, things would get better. And as you watch the movie unfold, spoiler alert, but honestly, if you haven't seen this yet, that's on you. That, that, that doesn't solve their problems. It's not really about changing their identity. And what I want you to understand today, follower of Christ, your identity has been declared by God for you. And that no matter what the problem is that you are facing, you are a dearly loved child of God. I love John 1, 12. For all who believed him and received him were given the right to be called sons and daughters of God. Like, that's your identity. I don't, I don't want to build Keith by being a great pastor, by being a great husband, by being a great father. Before I first understand, greatness comes from who God has called me to be, and he has called me to be his son, his adopted son. That's my position. And so when I go through life and when I navigate problems, I understand I don't need to gain a little bit more money to fix this problem. Man, how many of you, you be honest, we've been down that road where you just say, well, if I can make a little bit more money and I can get out of debt and I can save a little bit more, then I can start giving, then my problems will disappear. We already quoted one theologian, Jay-Z. Let's quote another one. More money, more problems. <laughs> well, we all know that's true. We, we, we're convinced of a lie, and, and Scripture just says don't trust in that. Don't trust there. Don't trust that if you can just change your status. Well, if I could get the promotion, if I could change careers, if I can grab the degree, then I'd be respected, I would be accepted. Those things are great. This is not a call to say don't chase greatness, but it is a call to say don't attach your identity to any of those things. It's not about the position that you have. It's about the position that's been given to you through the work of Jesus, through the gospel, that Jesus himself died to secure for you the greatest title that you could ever have, let me just speak it over you. You're, you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're a child of the king. He loves you. He sees you. He knows you. He sees your problem. And that problem does not undermine your position. Amen? Let me finish up with this. He says in verse 11, One thing God has spoken. Two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And, and here's our second part, you reward everyone according to what they have done. Let me spend a little bit of time here because I really want you to understand this. The problems in our lives really have a primary purpose, and it's that you and I would give up. That's the purpose of the problem. Like, the problem is coming at you and it's, it's just, I'm going to make this person give up. They're going to give up on their marriage. They're going to give up on their calling. They're going to give up on everything that God has promised. See, it's the enemy at work trying to entice and tempt and distract and destroy. But I'm so grateful that God says, no, actually, what you mean for evil, God's going to use for good. That there is a plan, a bigger plan that God has. But too often, we look at the problem and say, I'm going to give up. I can't get through this. I can't work through this. And what David is reminding us here, especially in that last line, you reward everyone according to what they have done. This final principle when it comes to problems is the word perseverance. That in the problem, we persevere. Now, lean into this because I don't want you to miss this. Did you see the order that David sang in? He said, God, your power, God, your love, and then we respond with work. Religion actually changes the order. 
Religion says you work in order to gain the love of God, in order to gain the power of God, and if you work hard enough, God will reward you with himself. But the gospel is not that. The gospel is salvation is a gift of grace. You actually can't work for your salvation. You can't earn it. It is a gift so that none of us can boast, that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and after being saved, we don't just throw up our hands and say, that's awesome, I can do whatever I want now. I'm in the club. No, Paul actually words it this way. He says, should I just go on sinning so that grace would abound even more? And he, he answers his own question and says, no way. Now, out of that love and out of that power, I persevere. I work hard. In fact, he wrote to the Corinthian church and used an analogy and said that our works are tested in fire, that some remain and some don't. Jesus said, store up your treasures in heaven. So we see throughout Scripture that there's these crowns that are waiting for us on how we live our lives as believers. And I don't know about you guys, but I want Jesus to open up a closet of Keith's crowns when I get to heaven. Just look at all these jewels that you, by the way that you lived. And, and, and I believe that God, he wants that for us. To persevere. To not give up in the problem. That God has a plan. And so I hope that Psalm 62 is just speaking some life to you. And really the word that stuck out to me the most is rest. Because you've got problems. I'm not trying to offend you, but you have problems. And I have problems. And, and all of us, we have those things. And yet there's a God that we look to. See, I, I said it already, but this week, so much of our country is looking to a political party to be in office or a political leader to be in office. And, and I'll just say this. Pray. And, and if your heart's stirred to vote in the direction, vote in the direction. If it's not, whatever that you, that's That's you praying and seeking God. But here's the thing that I would encourage you with and urge you with, especially if I'm your pastor. Like if, if Blaze Church is your church, I give you these three words. Trust in God. Trust in God this week. Don't so link yourself to the outcome of this election that if the person you voted for, the party you're polling for doesn't get in, that you're crushed and that all hope is lost. There's something I think I know. I think the world's still going to spin on Wednesday. I think it's still going to go on next week. I think you're still going to go to the same job or be around the same people. You're still going to have the same opportunities to be a representat representation for Jesus to the people around you. All of that is still going to take place. But here's what I want you to miss. Don't get so hung up. Don't get so caught up on this that you don't realize Jesus is your king. Come on, somebody celebrate that. Jesus is your king. It is not about someone being elected that causes us to say, well, this is the only way hope is going to come. In fact, as I was thinking about this, I started just writing down some different things that this is all about, that our country is navigating and facing. And yeah, there are some problems, and there are some uh, issues on the table, and there are some things, and, and policy, and, and politics is going to try its best to respond to these things. But you know what I realized? As believers, living out God's kingdom principles in our lives to the people in front of us, like loving our neighbor as ourself, that if we would be a church that does that, we will start to be the change that we hope to see. Come on, I, I really believe that. That if we would actually just love the person in front of you, love them. Like Paul says, the law of Christ is to love your neighbor. That we, we don't need to put all of our hope into a party. And I just started thinking about the issues. And I, and I realized, wow, the church can respond to that. And Jesus has already solved that. When it comes to immigration, love your neighbor. When it, when it comes to this planet, love. When it comes to black lives, love. When it comes to babies in the womb, love. When it comes to our economics, love. I just want you to realize that, that this week as we go into this, don't get so connected to a person to solve what Jesus has already said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be gracious to people around you. Show honor to others. Submit to one. All of these kingdom principles that I just know, like if we live these things out, Man, the world would be so different. And I don't want to be overwhelmed by that fact. I just want to know that God, start right here. Start with me. Well, what if that's your prayer going into this week? Lord, start with me. Help me love the person who maybe votes different, looks different, acts different, believes different. Start with me, Lord. Those problems are going to start to be solved. So I want to bring you into a problem that I have, and a problem that I had. So last week we had, you know, put a slide up and said, this week we've got this big announcement. We're excited to share some things that God's doing in our hearts and what he's stirring. I'll tell you what, church, like I've, I've been 
I've just been following God for the past couple weeks more than, more than I can even just unload, and I, I don't need to unload. But just God has just been stirring our hearts as a team and looking into things and all of this. And, and on Friday night, kind of a decision was made that there's a big announcement coming. We just don't have enough details to actually announce it today. Uh, the big, oh, what are you, maybe next week, maybe November 8th. But if, if you know me, like really know me, you, you know that I love systems, I love strategies, I love planning, I love timelines, I love spreadsheets, I love all of it. I love having it all in order. And even for this Sunday, like today, we plan out. Like we knew what was coming November 1st, and so we had songs chosen for it. I had a sermon written for it. In fact, on Thursday, I preached it to an empty room. That's my normal rhythm. And then I review it on Friday, and I pray through it. And everything was lined up, and then Friday night came have some conversations and said, hey, we can't really, we're not going to go public with this yet. And so with all of that, Friday night, I had to take a sermon that was written and say, well, that's just not going to work now. And I have a problem. And I, I tend to speak to God this way when I'm a little angry. Now what? <laughs> now, now what? Because in two days, I need something to share. And I, I need to be encouraged right now, Lord. And I want to be an encouragement to others. And actually, this message was written Friday night, about 9 p.m., with me sitting in my room with my head like this, <laughs> just asking, Lord, what, are, what do we do? And, and God, isn't God so faithful? He really is. That the problem that, that I'm just looking at, God's saying, I want to be your solution. I want you to rest in me. I want you to find hope in me. And I say all of that to let you know that just because I'm a pastor of this church does not mean I live a problem-free life, that all of us face problems. And at the same time, God's faithfulness to me is his faithfulness to you. That God has a perfect plan and that we're going to continue to walk humbly with him. And I'll say it this way this week because I got a little wiser since last week. I hope that next week I can share a big announcement with you. I hope that things are in a place where we can just kind of share and, and it's, it's all about us blazing beyond and the next step that God's leading our church to take in regards to our facility and our space and all of that. But I really want you to understand this today, church. God reigns above everything, doesn't he? He does. He, he's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for your marriage. He's got a plan for your relationships. He's got a plan for your finances. He's got a plan for you. His biggest plan was already fulfilled in Jesus coming to this world. You are an adopted child of God. And so our team is going to lead us in this song, Reign Above It All, where we're really just going to be reminded through music that God reigns above everything, that God is in control. He, he's going to work all things out for our good and for his glory, and we're going to keep trusting him along the way. And so I'd love to pray for you right now. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and as we get ready to sing, if you can um, put your mask back on. And, but I want to pray for you, especially if today you have a problem. Like you came in, and you already know what it is. You don't have to take a lot of time to think, because it's that thing that keeps you up at night. It's that thing that's dominating your prayers. It's that thing that maybe you're talking a lot about or not sharing about at all. But I believe that God reigns above it this morning. And I believe that the same principles that David had as he navigated a problem, that you and I can, we can grab as our own. And so I love to pray for you. And maybe like me during this prayer, I'm going to have my hands up just as a sign of surrender to God. Because I really, like, God's got to take care of this. God's the one who's in charge. He, he's the one who's the solution maker. And so as I pray, if that's you, I'd love for you to just, as a sign of surrender to God, I just, God, my hands are up. God, I, I'm giving it to you today. So Lord, I thank you that you care enough about us, that you call us to cast our cares on you. I thank you, Lord, for a, a heart of faith to rise up in us, to trust you in the midst of the problem. Lord, I pray that we do not attach the solution to our problems to any person, not ourselves, not elected leaders, no one, God, you are the solution to our problems. You are the one that we turn to. You are, are first and foremost our reigning king, and you are over all things. And so, Lord, we surrender to you our relationships. We surrender to you our habits. I pray for the one right now who is caught up in an addiction that seems like it can't be broken. In Jesus' name, that burden is being lifted right now. God, I bring before you the person whose marriage is just hanging on by a thread and it seems all hope is lost. In Jesus' name, restoration and reconciliation is happening. God, I pray for that single right now that feels like they are alone and hopeless and doesn't know how to navigate this next season. God, speak softly. Speak rest. 
Lord, all of us, we bring our problems to you and we trust you, God. You're our way maker. You're our miracle worker. You are the one who reigns above all things. We bring our country before you, Lord. We do pray that we would look up before we look out this week. That we would surrender to you, our King. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.